Currently, rods are outsourced to another company to have threads cut on a Swiss lathe. Sometimes that company has long lead times that hinder production at TNT tools. An in-house method to cut threads would be used during periods of long lead times to increase production. Some of the constraints and specifications of the project were that the machine must be able to automatically thread 3 8 inch and 7 8 inch long 3 8 24 UNF 2 a threads onto 3 8 inch diameter rods. An optional specification was for the machine to thread 15 16 inch long 1 half 13 UNCA threads onto half inch diameter rods. The machine must be powered by either 120 volt, 240 volt three phase power, or 480, 460 volt three phase power. The machine must meet safety standards, both mechanical and electrical. Any pneumatic component used must operate with a 90 PSI air supply, and the machine must be movable with a forklift. The method used for forming threads is a geometric style self-opening die head that uses chasers for cutting threads. When the desired thread length is reached, the front of the die head rotates and the chasers expand. The die head then needs to be rotated with the handle to reset for the next cut, as seen in the current demonstration. In this video, a prototype will be demonstrated. The rod is first loaded up against a hard stop and then secured in the chuck. The die head is secured in the lathe's tailstock. Once the spindle is turned on, the die head and tailstock is moved into position. The die head's chasers then begin cutting. Once the desired thread length is reached, the die head rotates and expands. The thread is now cut into the rod. First, the operator loads the rod into the lathe. The hard stop mechanism swings up with the chuck guard to locate the rod. Locating the rod ensures consistent thread length. Additionally, the chuck guard keeps the operator safe by preventing threading from happening while the guard is up. The die reset mechanism is shown below the die head. A pneumatic cylinder attached to a bracket will actuate and automatically reset the die head. A stud mounted ball transfer was fitted to the end of the cylinder to prevent rubbing and wear between the end of the cylinder and the die head arm. This is the driving mechanism for the tailstock. The linear actuator advances the tailstock forward to initiate threading and pulls back on the tailstock to release the die head at desired thread length. Guide rods and linear bearings were added to protect the linear actuator against external moments. Our pump is an 1 8 horsepower gray mills pump. It pumps Oster threading oil onto the rod to aid in both cooling and lubricating during cutting. The oil was designed specifically for applying external threads onto a rod. The pump includes an adjustable nozzle and a flow rate regulator. Many fuses were added to the system to help protect from possible power surges and surge suppression. In addition to fuses being added to the new electrical circuit for new components, fuses were also added to the old lathe circuit to help protect components from possible surges. There wasn't a lot of protection in the old lathe circuit due to this being a very old lathe and different regulations back in the day were less strict on safety than they are nowadays. For enclosure selection, the size of the enclosure was determined by three separate factors. The first factor is the depth of the field panel, which was chosen because of the servo drive size. The servo drive is roughly seven inches long, and it needs to have room for wires to stick out of the front. Additionally, there are heat diffusion and separation of 480 volts from the rest of the components that affect the size of the panel, notably the width and the height. Um, 
Heat diffusion is pretty self-explanatory. We don't want components to overheat within our panel if they are too close to each other. Um, and separating the 480 volts both helps the components from possible um, interference with the 480 to say 24 volts, which is a 20 times step down. And it also could protect any operators that are in the panel while it is live adjusting things. The subpanel is unpainted to assist in grounding all components. For example, DIN rails running across have a direct connection to the subpanel, which can be grounded to the earth ground in the lathe panel. And the servo drive is directly bonded to the subpanel, which helps it with two things, both grounding directly to earth ground through the subpanel, and it also helps with high frequency noise because of the surface area being covered. In both the new field panel and the old lathe panel, covers were added to help protect any user inside the panels when connected to power. These are over fuse blocks and um, connectors that are connected to 480 volts. And lastly, the enclosure door has an interlock that activates as soon as 480 volts is within the panel, the new panel. This prevents the door from being able to be opened with power inside. To protect wires that are to be run between any of the panels, like the new panel, the old lathe panel, the HMI panel, or the transformer box, insulated conduit was run between them. This helps protect it from any environmental damage, as well as separating 24 volts, 120 volts, and 480 volt wires, um, which are to be run through separate lines of conduit, even if being sent to the same location. This helps protect them from interference between each other. The old transformer in the old lathe panel has been replaced by a 3 kilovolt amp transformer that has been added to the machine that converts the 480 volt three phase input from the shop power and steps it down to two 120 volt legs. The two separate legs are to be used both separately and combined. 120 volts, singular, is going to be used to power many components in the lathe, such as the spindle motor. Combining those two legs will give you 240 volts, and this is to be specifically used to power the servo drive. There's additionally a 120 volt AC to 24 volt DC converter that is used to put 24 volts to most of our components in our panel, such as HMI and PLC. The PLC being used is of the Micro 800 family. To program the PLC, we are using Connected Components Workbench, and this works for both the HMI and the PLC. The PLC has 14 inputs and 10 outputs with the ability to be expanded. The PLC controls most of our components within our lathe. Anything automated is controlled through the PLC, through both sensors and through outputs. The PLC is communicated to both the servo drive and the HMI with Ethernet cords. For the servo drive and linear actuator, we wanted to be able to program and monitor its position as well as be able to change its torque limit and its velocity while it's moving. For the linear actuator, we wanted to have three discrete positions, one at its start and finish point, one where the die head begins threading, and one where the die head stops threading and is disengaged. We want the velocity of the linear actuator to be rapid from its start point to the beginning of threading, which will help reduce cycle time. At this point, the torque limit is to be changed, and the velocity is to be reduced to the same velocity that the die head is going to thread the rod at. Finally, from the finishing of threading, we want the linear actuator to move back to its start position at a rapid pace to help reduce cycle time. The HMI push buttons and pilot lights are all used in conjunction to allow the operator to understand what state the machine is in as well as allowing them to control the operation of the machine. The HMI has multiple functions for the user. On the HMI screen, the user will be able to select rod diameter and length to cut, increment the cutting length, and see any errors that may have occurred on an alarm management screen. The rod length of cut may need to be adjusted over time if there is possible tool wear or any other such thing. One of these push buttons on the HMI panel is an e-stop. The e-stop has been added to the machine to cut power to any moving components if something has gone wrong with the process. To do so, the e-stop is wired directly into a safety relay that will allow it so that all of those wiring connections open up as soon as the e-stop is pressed, cutting power to any of those moving components. There are two main functions for our pneumatic circuit. The first is to control a single acting spring return pneumatic cylinder that is used to reset the die head once threading has been completed. The other is an air blow that will clean coolant and chips off of our rods once the rod threading has been completed. 
These sit on a two-way four valve manifold that is controlled using our PLC circuit. The extra two valves are used in case something needed to be added to our system, such as another angle for an air blow. But prior to the manifold in the circuit, there is a filter to clean any incoming air to the manifold, a regulator to change the pressure coming into the manifold, and a shutoff valve that will shut off air and exhaust it prior to coming to the manifold in case something needed to be stopped. Throughout the course of the project, a number of challenges were faced. One example was supply chain issues. Over a dozen components ordered through our primary vendor had lead times longer than four months. Alternate vendors needed to be found, but even some of those had similar lead times. Another challenge came with retrofitting the electrical systems of a used lathe. The electrical system could not be finalized until a specific lathe had been chosen, but even the chosen lathe presented unforeseen issues once we started dissecting the electrical system. The final challenge was electrical and controls engineering issues. All four group members are mechanical engineers who had limited experience with electrical circuits and virtually no experience with controls engineering prior to the project. This knowledge had to be learned during the course of the project by taking classes and consulting with professors.